<laughs> Actually, I do have a point of um, clarity and a, a couple of changes we'd like to make to the resolution. Um, so if I could pass over to Steve Ballard just quickly, please. All quite minor, hopefully. Uh, if we turn to the resolution 6.1.3, uh, the original idea when we drafted it is that we could get applications verbally or in writing given the contact that the task force have with the affected people. Uh, it's probably going to be easier to manage if we do it all in writing. We've drafted up a standard form that's basically the same sort of design as we use for the earthquake remission. Um, that will be available from, um, through the task force team from our service centres or online. I, d I just. I d violent, violent, violent femmes. I just had a question around um, vulnerability, and, um, and and it's really if people are not if they're not in their homes they can apply. But we know, and you might have picked this up too early at the meetings, that there are people who are soldiering on in houses that should not be lived in. Do we have a um, ability to identify those and have their homes assessed as being unlivable, either by council staff or by DHB, or is there another a vehicle that we can use to find those people? Because there's ones who don't come forward. Mm. Do you know yeah, I do know what you mean. It's a fair question. Uh, the short answer is, from a rates perspective, no. It, that is a good question to ask the flooding task force, though, because they may have a better idea. I've got to say that, that generally the um, the way we treat the earthquake damage is on a reasonably rigid sort of a basis. It requires people to actually be out of their houses. And there's exactly the same situation happening there. The people are living in, in frankly awful situations, but they, for whatever reason, can't or don't want to move out of their house and they're living in their current home. The purpose of that remission when it started was to compensate people in a small way for the disruption of actually moving out. And that's why it's not applied to people still there, however unbalanced that might seem. Thank you. I'm, I'm just concerned that with a, you know, a high number of people, a high proportion of people who um, have literacy issues in our city, some being quite illiterate, that you're um, notwithstanding the written um, recommendation, you're really asking for that to be changed so that the applications be made only in writing. But can you just comment on how, for us, if, if we're to, to accept that, how people who have literacy issues in fact will be able to apply? Well, as I said, they, they will be available, obviously online, but for a lot of people, whether they're literate or not, that won't be very available at all. Um, they will also be available at our uh, service centres uh, and from the task force team themselves. My expectation, to be honest, is that a bulk of people affected would have their initial contact with the task force team because the task force team have already been in contact with them. Uh, that would be the first port of call. Um, the service centres would be the second port of call. Uh, and our call centre will be briefed as well, and they, they can be helped through. But this is this is for them. That would that would help give them information about it. But in turn, are you is, are there enough staff at the service centre to say to assist people to write to fill out their applications? I think so. Yes, especially given the numbers involved. Uh, it, it's, again, it's the same approach as was taken for the earthquake damage, and there were several thousands of those. Thank you. My question is about 6.1.4. How do you measure habitability? What is habitable and what isn't? How do you define that? Because that's quite different from a dwelling which may be able to be occupied or not. And the reason I ask this is that this was a part of previous council's debates over red zone houses. Yeah. And uh, I'm going to support this, but I could never get my colleagues across the line over habitability. So I'm really keen to try and nut this out. <laughs> well, I'm open to the suggestion that the earthquake one, use that as a parallel again. With the earthquake one, it was reasonably strict in, and quite straightforward in that there's an expectation that there would be some correspondence from either an insurance company or an independent engineer that could give us comfort that, yes, this was genuinely uninhabitable. With this, uh, thinking was that it just isn't really practical to, to achieve that. Um, reliance is going to be placed on the earthquake task force again to identify it, clearly if the house has been flooded more than twice or twice or more over the floorboards uh, and it's been difficult to effect repair because of the delays, you know, people are waiting to do their repair until council's done its remediation, then 
it'll be a judgment call. It's a, a little bit less rigid than for the earthquakes, but again, given the relatively small numbers, given the clear uh, damage caused by the number of flooding events, given also that the incentive for people to move out just to get the rates from mission is actually pretty small, um, then it's, it's a risk, I think, that's the, the, the most practical way to do it. Uh, oh, sorry, could I interrupt you very yeah, no, briefly please. if I can? Because oh, I'm glad you raised that. The one other change we wanted to make to the resolutions, if that's the right time to mention it, is on 6.1.4, uh, we should probably specify a backdating limit to the first event, 5th of March. Yeah. It's just an oversight. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, just a couple of quick things. Uh, what is being done, if anything, to engage insurers who quite clearly are important in this at the assessment level? I think you've already said yourself that there is, I'm paraphrasing, but some degree of reliance on the information coming from insurance companies, and I, so I wonder what engagement, if any, has been secured with them? None from the rates team. I don't know what the Task Flooding Task Force yeah. have, have done, I'm sorry. Okay, um, thank you. 4.5.8, uh, remission should be set at 100% of rates, mm -hmm. and then forgive me as I read the rest of that, it could be actually Mandarin. Could you explain that to <laughs> me? It's me more than um, yeah. anything, I think. Would you mind? Um, okay, the earthquake rates remissions we give, there's two principal ones that affect residential properties. The, the one that we talk about most of the time is the uninhabitable one, where it's really just a, the way it's evolved, it, it's trying to treat owners of uninhabitable damaged houses in the same way as people whose houses were damaged and subsequently demolished. So in other words, it's ignoring the improvements, it's just rating, but it is still rating on the value of the But land. you're rating on the land in that situation, Correct. aren't you? Right. Yes. And so in that case, damaged house not demolished, damaged house demolished, equal treatment, but still pay rates on the land. The other earthquake remission in the section 124s for the Port Hills is where the council has effectively forced people to evacuate because of the danger of rockfall and, and, and so on. 100% remission is given to those people, uh, and at the time it was considered that that was more appropriate because it wasn't really something that they could remediate. If you've got a problem because of a rock, above your house that's not on your property, you can't do anything about it. Council is taking an action to force you out of there. You've got to wait until a third party has remediated something before you can move back into a property that might not even be damaged. Thinking was that this situation with the flooding is more analogous to that section 124 situation where people are out of their house because of the damage, but it's difficult for them to fix the damage to their property until after council has done its remediation work because either themselves or their insurance company isn't comfortable about making those repairs if there's a, a significant risk of reflooding prior to that work. So you're saying it's likely that the 100% remission a la the S124 application would, would would be applied in this situation as well? That's the proposal, yes, 100% propo Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, great, yeah. thanks. Okay, no further questions, Yanni? Yes. So, like, there will be people that have hardship because of the flooding that don't move out of their house for whatever reason. Is there any process or policy that we have in place that we could actually consider some form of remission for those people? Uh, not at the moment, no. And th that's the same for the people living in damaged earthquake houses. If they're still in their property at the moment, there's no remission for... Uh, and uh, it's very difficult well, to recognise. Within this, we've just addressed the rates remission issue that we were asked to bring back um, by the end of May. So that's outside the scope of this, this report. Actually, I think this was one of the issues that was raised at the time and one of the reasons for this coming back was there was concern that there's people that have been really adversely affected financially who have financial hardship because of the flooding that that we possibly would want to consider some sort of rates remission but you guys haven't obviously done that work um, we've so focused on the rates remission element of the request absolutely that was the direction to us to come back with a uh, a proposal around rates remission for flooding affected rate pass. So my, my understanding that council actually has a it has some form of um, process by which if people do have financial hardship regardless of what caused it they can actually seek some sort of form of rates relief. Uh, there is there's a government rebate scheme based on income. Uh, there are arrangements we can make for for instance, automatic payments, uh, payment schedules, but there's there's no 
um, part of rates policy that gives people effectively a discount or, or a reduced rate for financial hardship. But they can currently apply to the Mayor's Welfare Fund if they want to. I'm sorry? Okay. They can Thanks. currently apply to the Mayor's Welfare Fund. I think that's an important The restrictions point. that were on that fund have been completely limit, uh, lifted so that it's available for any form of hardship. And, and the limit's been slightly li raised as well. I should say as well, for elderly people in financial difficulty, we do have a postponement scheme where rates can be postponed and interest will be charged as, as, as if it's a loan. Uh, would it be fair to say that because of the need to make some decision and apply something like a rates remission ASAP, it was the terms of reference were kept to what was considered around the earthquake rates remission so that we weren't reinventing the wheel? I'm just looking to respond a little bit to what Yanni was saying, and although there may be other issues, that's what you were looking at and basing your recommendations on so that we could get something in place for people as soon as possible? In part, yes, because that was the, the brief, and that's also the precedent, which is very useful. Um, I, I think, to be honest, even if we had more time, it would be very difficult to come up with a robust regime that tried to... Effectively, what we're talking about is trying to quantify degree of hardship. Uh, and it, it's such a difficult thing to do in a robust sort of way, and, and the resources required to do it is just... It's rates Particularly that was unit. equitable across the city, given the state of some people's houses. Rates policy is quite a blunt instrument. It just yes, I totally understand. I've got Jimmy, Paul, Pauline. One question is that regarding the flooding issue, the other flood-affected areas, if outside the mayor flooding task force report, you know, for a couple of weeks ago, uh, for instance, the, uh, the last week uh, during the, uh, the annual plan review, the Templeton uh, you know, Resident Association on behalf of, of the community you know, in Mahoy Street and the Running Mill Street, you know, in case they have any the rainfalls the, to cause the flooding, etc., or in the Hosewell area, you know, where we close to the mm -hmm. uh, Henderson Basin. The, this kind of cause the, the flood, whether you know, can be go to the, this one or not. Yeah. Uh, so the, the rates remission policy would apply in circumstances um, where people had moved out of their houses, they were uninhabitable due to flooding. Um, from memory, the Templeton one was more flooding outside the chemists and the, the local store than into the houses, so with that particular example, um, it's probably not applicable. Um, and people probably wouldn't have moved out of their houses. But this is not um, defined by a geographical zone, uh, more, the, more the events. I think also there's an expectation amongst the task force team that the publicity around this will actually prompt people who have been affected and not previously identified to actually come forward and contact them. And that's why in the financial analysis 5.3 there, which was really put in at the 11th hour in this paper, it was an acknowledgement that, well, the initial expectations, we might end up with more for exactly that sort of reason. It would be fair to say that if we open the bandwidth of eligibility to this, this uh, relief, we could therefore cause uh, normal rate payers who are actually struggling to pay their own rates to become eligible because they come under the financial stress <laughs> of what this problem is caused. So uh, yeah. would that be a fair assumption? Because we don't really know exactly how big this is going to be. It could be a million, it could be three million, which is then therefore a percent of the rates. Rates got one percent affects a large amount of people. So the question I'm asking is, the wider the bandwidth, the more problems we could cause for uh, uh, existing ratepayers to apply if we open the bandwidth up. That's exactly the trade-off um, with this, this type of rates remission policy. And you'll see in paragraph 2.5 and 2.6 that there's been some um, attempt to quantify what the impact might be on the, on the overall um, rates base um, based on you know, some expectations of of size, um, which at this stage is, is still reasonably um, still reasonably um, rough in terms of an estimate and might have a, a large degree of variability around it. But you can see in there we're saying 0.1%, 0.2% uh, type of range at this point. That thin end of the wedge sort of concept is a fair one though, uh, and that's one of the reasons why this, along with the earthquake ones before it, tried to make the criteria uh, 
sufficiently narrow that it was both clear without too much subjective judgment and also not creating that sort of effect you're talking about. Just a quick technical question around um, 6.1.4. So if somebody was to, some, in the grey area, somebody is living in their house and it's actually not habitable, they now go, okay, look, I, I can go, this is going to, would they still be eligible to have that um, backdated to the date of the flood which caused that, or would it be from when they move out? Uh, the so they're still living in it now, yeah. this they go, okay, actually this is going to make it okay for me to go and stay somewhere else, um, and they go now, and it's a genuine reason because they have yep. been living there and they shouldn't have been, yep. are they eligible to, to backdate to the flood? The proposal as it stands is only from the date that they actually move out. Um, the logic of that was one consistency with the earthquake remissions, but also in principle because the purpose of the compensation is small part of compensation for the disruption right. and difficulty and cost Could of actually that be out. clarified in the in the resolution there if the public are reading that they might just think well I go now I can backdate my to the date of departure from the property but in any case no later than no earlier than the 5th of March excellent yeah yeah and least you get that guys would, 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 it, would an event last year have caused anyone to leave not that we're aware of, but it was something that we were sensitive to. Uh, and to the again, date you, of departure from the a property. Uh, concept here. If yeah. someone had been in a particular house that, for whatever reason, was flooded by a freak event or a stormwater or whatever else, and they moved out for six months while the insurance was done, we don't want to get involved in that kind of, of um, well, deal. We're going to try and narrow it down to current case, no, no earlier then. Okay, Andrew, and then we might put it. Um, <laughs> One of the areas identified in, in the um, original resolution that set up the task force was Littleton, and it's recognised that Littleton has got what the Mayor described as some peculiar issues um, regarding flooding, which relate to the um, relationship between flooding and landslip. Would the way that the staff recommendation has been framed cover, if somebody was out of their house because of a flood-related landslip, would that be covered by this, or does it need to be specified? Probably, I'm thinking it's possibly better if it is specified. Not being considered is the honest answer no. to that. Um, what I've typically done in, in yeah. previous situations is moved amendments to these resolutions to, mm. to have put in there um, all flood-related landslip. Peter just suggested an instant um, uh, judgment, and I agree that it, I don't think that would be included by by these, the intention is for direct flood damage, so water entry into the home. Okay, are you happy with 6.1.4 as it now is? It's just a slight amendment to take into account, Pauline's. I think so, yes. Query. Are you guys okay with it because... Okay. Okay, can I put the... Just before you do, I'm sorry. <laughs> the, 6.1.6, a very minor technical adjustment, but the poor yes. guy's title is short and that. He's just the transactions manager. <laughs> so delete rates and team. Okay, we can do that. Well, can I go back to the point Andrew was raising, just for people in Little to say, where the, the flooding affected um, land and there were land slips, and it, this excludes them from being able to have any rates um, <coughs> rebate. And I, I, it just seems to me that, in, in fairness, mm. because we're including other areas, that we should include that component. But I, I did note Peter's concern, but I, my understanding is there's not a lot of properties currently affected, but could we have some comment about that? No, I, th I think to cover the issue, a, a further report, and perhaps we need to ask for that though, um, would be a fair way of doing it, because we, you, you're right, we don't have any clear understanding of the number of properties that are affected. Yeah. 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 Do we need to change 6.14? Yeah, sorry, literary advisor, quite right too. 6.1.4, um, the wording just doesn't quite make sense. Can we change it so it's any remission will be backdated to the date of departure from the property and then delete the words that... Brenda Dunn in Hamtel. Thank you. Ah, you're quite right. Delete that one as well. Okay. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.